introduction to astronomy series, and tonight um, it's my pleasure and your pleasure to have our guest speaker again from Hamilton, who's well known to a lot of us. Um, his talks are fantastic. Um, so, Jonathan Park from Hamilton. Thank you, Jonathan. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> Well, thanks for all coming along tonight to learn about the moons of Jupiter. Now, there's 79 of them, so I'll only spend about 10 minutes talking about each one. <laughs> Just kidding. So, probably a lot of you know about the four main moons of Jupiter, but a lot of people don't know about the other 75, which are very quite in really quite interesting. Now, it looks a bit of a mess, really, doesn't it? A bit of a mess and rather complicated, but I'll try and make sense of that for you later on tonight. So some key points that I'll go over tonight will be the fact that Jupiter has 79 known moons, 8 are called regular moons, 71 are called irregular moons, and 21 are still to be named. So I'll explain the regular and irregular moons later on. There's probably a lot more. There may be up to 600 of about a kilometre in diameter or, or more. Um, that is calculated from a survey that was done of a, a region around Jupiter and extrapolated out to about 600 more. So it's going to be fun to do the talk next um, you know, two years' time. <laughs> and it probably uh, lost a few larger moons in the past as well, the four large ones that you see through the telescope, maybe the second or third generation of large moons, as the earlier ones may have actually... Um, collided with Jupiter when Jupiter was forming and there was a lot of gas around um, the planet which um, slowed them down and um, took them out of orbit. So Jupiter's irregular moons, which I'll explain later, uh, generally captured asteroids, comets or Kuiper belt objects. They're probably mainly the remains of larger objects which broke apart probably through tidal forces or collisions. And the known 71 were probably originally about eight or nine objects. Now, Jupiter's irregular moons, we can actually group them by their colours and their orbits, and by doing that, we can um, work out where they came from, and that simplifies the um, previous uh, diagram quite a bit. So, the questions tonight, um, you're probably wondering, what is a moon anyway? Um, I'll talk about orbits um, and what regular and irregular moons are. I'll have a, a bit of a talk about the small moons um, inside uh, the big ones that we see, as well as Jupiter's rings, the Galilean moons, and the outside moons. So these are just some of the pictures coming up a bit later on, which I'll explain later, but some quite interesting stuff happening out that way. So first things first, where is Jupiter? Here's Earth, one astronomical unit away from the Sun, which is about 150 kilometres. An astronomical unit is the definition of, well, distance from the Sun to the Earth is defined as one astronomical unit. And out here is Jupiter, just a little bit over five times as far as Earth from the Sun. It's about 43 light minutes. So Earth's about 8.3 light minutes from the Sun, Jupiter about 43 light minutes. Uh, almost getting close to a billion kilometres away from the Sun. And over here we can just see Mars. And in this area here would be the asteroid belt between Jupiter and Mars. So first question, what is a moon? So it's not that. <laughs> what is it? A space station. So there actually is no scientific or formal definition of a moon. It's up in the air pretty much at the moment. But generally it's... Um, also known as a natural satellite, any natural object that orbits any of uh, a planet, a dwarf planet, an asteroid, or even a Kuiper belt object. And quite a neat example is this asteroid here, Ida, and its little moon, Dactyl. This asteroid is actually found in the asteroid belt between uh, Mars and Jupiter. A lot of asteroids actually do have moons. There's been a, a couple come towards our way with uh, even two moons uh, orbiting them. So when a moon gets that small, it's still called a moon because there's no definition. Some people might call them moonlets or dwarf moons. But I think um, after the um, upset with uh, demoting, well not demoting Pluto, but calling Pluto a dwarf planet, um, a lot of people might have um, been a bit worried they might get in trouble by trying to call these things something else. So they're just called moons at the moment or natural satellites. 
So to understand Jupiter's moons, we really just have to understand orbits a little bit first of all. So an orbit is an ellipse, which is a circle or a squashed circle. It can be a planet orbiting a star, a moon orbiting a planet, or anything, any object orbiting its host. So this is a, a more extreme um, elliptical orbit where we have our planet here and our host, well, our moon and our host here. The more elliptical or the more squashed the orbit is, the further away the um, host is from the centre and it actually sits in what's called, if, for those mathematical people here, sits in what's called the focus of the ellipse, so there's a focus at each end. And the um, object orbiting the um, host will be at its fastest here, the closest point to the um, host, which is called the periapsis, and it will slow down as it moves further away. At its furthest point, the apoapsis, it's at its slowest, and then speeds up again, so faster and slower. Now, we call the um, amount of squashing of the circle of the orbit, the eccentricity, um, just given the letter E. A circle has an eccentricity of zero. Earth's orbit around the sun is almost a circle. You wouldn't be able to tell that's not a, well, from here you can't. I can't tell if that's a circle or not. It's um, got such a low eccentricity, so it's not quite a circle. This exoplanet here, HD 20782b, which orbits a star called HD 20782, <laughs> has an ellipticity of 0.96, so it's getting quite highly elliptical. And that's about the shape of the orbit of Halley's Comet around our own star as well. Some comets are getting pretty close to an uh, eccentricity of 1. Uh, you can't quite get to 1, it gets closer and closer to 1. So as they get pretty close here, these would be long period comets which could take hundreds of thousands to even a million years to go around the sun, and would generally be the long period comets that come from the Oort cloud way, way out in space. The next thing we need to know is something called the inclination. <clears throat> the inclination is just the angle of the orbit in respect, with respect to the planet's equatorial um, plane. So, for example, the moon Io orbits Jupiter almost, um, oops, almost exactly um, in the orbital plane, so it has an inclination of just about zero degrees. Another of Jupiter's moons, uh, Themisto, has an inclination of about 43 degrees, and so that is orbiting quite a, an angle there, but we actually have to zoom out a little bit to see how big the orbit of Themisto is, so we can see now that it actually gets quite away from Jupiter. And just in comparison, that's the Earth to the Moon distance there, about the same as Jupiter to Io. So you can see that's going quite a long way out. But if you think that's a long way, this is Moon S2017J6. This actually gets 35 million kilometres away from Jupiter. It has an inclination of 155.2 degrees, which means it's actually flipped right over the other way and it's actually orbiting the other way around. Its eccentricity is 0 0.557, which means it's a fairly squashed um, orbit. Now, 35 million kilometres, the distance that, um, the closest distance that Venus can get to Earth is about 61 million kilometres. Now, that's when they're both around the same side of the Sun. Earth is at its closest and Venus is the furthest away from the Sun it can get. So this distance here of this Moon is actually over halfway between Earth and Venus at their closest point. Um, of course, they, Earth and Venus are usually a lot further apart, but occasionally they can get that close. So you can see that's a, a long way out. Now that name, it's not because people got sick of naming the Moons, um, what that is is that S means satellite, 2017 is the year, is, year it was discovered, J for Jupiter, and 6 means the sixth moon of Jupiter got discovered in 2017. The next thing we just need to quickly have a look at is the direction of the orbit. If you're looking down on the solar system from the north, or from the Earth's north, and looking down on top of the solar system, Jupiter will ro uh, rotate in anti-clockwise direction. Any moon that orbits at the same, in the same direction as the planet 
rotates is called a prograde orbit. If it goes the other way, backwards, <laughs> it's a retrograde orbit. So just as a quick summary of what we've just been through at this stage, we have the semi-major axis A, which I didn't actually talk about, that's just the size of the orbit. And the distance between the centre of the ellipse and the furthest um, point is called the semi-major axis, A for axis. With how circular or squash it is, that's E, the inclination I, and the same or opposite direction as the planet rotates. And even simply, if you just want to remember, A, E, and I, size, how squashed, the angle, and fall are backwards. So just remembering A, E, and I is quite an easy way to do it. It's just a bit of a coincidence that they're so easy to remember from that. So now that we've learned a bit about the orbits, um, I can explain what regular and irregular moons are. A regular moon, it's nothing to do with the size or with the shape or the size of the moon itself, it's all to do with the orbit. So a prograde orbit, if a moon has a prograde orbit, and it's just about circular, and the inclination is just about zero, then it's defined as a regular moon. Anything that's not a regular moon is an irregular moon, so everything else. Nice and easy to remember. So if something goes in a retrograde orbit, it doesn't even matter if it's circular and low inclination. If it goes backwards, it's, a, it's an irregular moon. Or if it has a highly eccentric and highly inclined orbit, it's also a retrograde, uh, sorry, also an irregular moon. Um, even these um, ones with a high eccentricity or high inclination, if they, whether they're going prograde or retrograde, they're still classed as irregular moons. A couple of examples. These are two moons. This is Amalthea and this is Europa, two regular moons of Jupiter. This one here, Amalthea, is actually a lot smaller. So if you can see it, that's the scale. It's rather a small one. So these are both regular moons. And over here we have Triton. This is the largest moon of Neptune. Um, it's a nice large moon. It's to scale with Europa here. This is um, in the retrograde circular um, category. So it goes backwards around uh, Neptune and is uh, classed as an irregular moon. If it was going the other way, it would just be called a regular moon, but it was probably captured from the uh, Kuiper Belt. It was probably a dwarf planet that was captured in the past at some stage. So just having a quick look at all of Jupiter's moons here, I'm not going to go through all 79, don't worry about that. But the four big ones here that you probably all know, we have, um, we have Io, Europa, Ganymede and Callisto and all the others. So you can see how small these are, you can hardly even see the other ones there. If I zoom in a bit it helps. So it's <laughs> still quite hard to see. So these are zoomed in about nine times from what they were before. So I'll just show you a couple of these ones quickly just so you get to know some of them. So first of all, we have Himalaya, about 170 kilometres wide. Amalthea, which we saw before, about 125 kilometres. This one, Thebe, about 100 kilometres. <coughs> Elara, Matisse. And getting down to the slightly smaller ones here, now we have Themisto, which we saw before with its um, orbit. And then all the way down to the smallest one here, Valetudo, which was only just discovered not too many years ago. And is a rather unusual moon we'll have a look at in a moment. All these ones here, all about two kilometres or smaller in diameter. So there's other 600 that may be out there that possibly will be out there, are probably all this kind of size here. And it's always interesting just to compare the moons to other objects in the solar system. So Io and our moon, not too different in size, and also both about the same distance from the um, host planet. Uh, here's Pluto, Europa, and over here Callisto and the planet Mercury. And of course Ganymede, the biggest moon um, of Jupiter and in the whole solar system, is even bigger than, of course, um, the planet Mercury. So you may or may not know that Jupiter actually has a set of rings. This is how we usually see Jupiter. But 
if we can get round behind it with the sun behind it, um, we can actually just make out these very faint rings. They're just very tenuous, dusty rings, which um, you can only really see under the right circumstances. They actually go a little bit further, but are even more, even thinner, out to probably about this distance here. And there's another one in, in just in here called the halo ring. And that's just another view of the rings. So the moons that you'll usually see through a, a small telescope or a good pair of binoculars, Io, Europa, Ganymede and Callisto, the four large ones. And as I mentioned before, we have the rings, but there's also four smaller moons inside the orbits here. These are the Amalthea group. These four are probably part of a larger moon that broke up in the past or they may have been captured by Jupiter, but I think it's probably more likely that they've been actually part of the one larger moon, which would have been called Amalthea, if, Amalthea sorry. If you have a, a moon broken up into parts, usually the largest moon in the group is what you'll name the larger original one after. This is a, a photo actually taken by a Voyager in, two, in 1979. It's the <coughs> reddest object in the solar system. Um, this is an artist's impression of what it might look like. So the actual photo there just shows how red it is. So Amalthea is actually, apart from just being the, the reddest um, object in the solar system, actually gives off more heat than it uh, receives from the sun. This could be due to electric currents being set up inside the moon as it moves through Jupiter's uh, magnetic field, um, or it could be a bit of tidal heating and stretching as it goes around Jupiter, or a bit of a mix of both. So you can see the rings to here and these four inner moons here. These two moons here actually feed this ring. Micrometeorites hitting these moons knock little pieces off them and add dust to the rings here. And probably these ones being hit by meteorites as well just add to the very, very tenuous rings that you can't even see in the photos, um, which come out to about this distance here. Matisse and Adrastia both orbits um, fairly close to each other, so there's only a thousand kilometres difference in the orbits, and that's why they're so close together there. Matisse is close enough to Jupiter that it actually only takes seven hours to go around. Um, Jupiter takes um, ten hours to rotate once. So it's whipping around pretty fast, out to Amalthea, which takes about 12 hours, and Io, which takes 42 and a half, just less than two Earth, day, uh, Earth days to circle. To orbit. So those are the eight regular moons, and as you now know, the regular moons are the ones with the circular orbits, prograde, and fairly low inclination. So we've looked at the um, four inner regular moons. I'm going to come back to these other larger ones at a later stage. So if we just zoom out and just have a quick look at all these orbits, keep zooming out there. And you can see how much of a mess it looks. It's like spaghetti. But we'll, we will make sense of that soon. That's not even all of them. I think there's about 10 missing out of that uh, image, but that's enough <laughs> for there. So there's another view um, looking down on top. This image is actually taken from the website of Scott Shepard from the Earth and Planets Laboratory at the Carnegie Institute for, Institution for Science. He's actually credited with discovering 60, that's 6 O of Jupiter's moons, which is quite amazing. So 60 moons are discovered by this man, and of course the four Galilean moons by Galileo. Um, Amalthea was discovered by Mr Barnard, um, who Barnard's star is named after, and I can't tell you who the other ones are, are named after. So, I mentioned before Valetudo, the um, little one um, that we saw at the end of the, the list of moons. Valetudo here is a prograde moon. All the red ones are retrograde, all the other colours are prograde. So you can see Valetudo is prograde, and you can see why collisions occur when all these other ones are. It's like going down the wrong way of the highway. And so there's probably a lot more pieces of Valetudo out there too. It, it's um, pretty likely that it was a bigger object which just kept crashing into stuff as it was, as it was orbiting. This is the misto that we saw 
earlier as well. And a couple of small ones here, Carpo and uh, what have we got, Carpo. And this one here, the Himalaya group is actually a whole group of uh, moons all in a prograde orbit. So we'll skip ahead and try and make some sense of this um, picture here. If we take each moon and we look at the size of the orbit, the semi-major axis, and we look at the inclination, the angle it's on, and just plot the moon there, and we do it for every single one, then it's almost, you can always see a pattern starting to occur. It's almost like these are all part of the same group. And it actually is part of the same, each one is part of a, a group. These ones here that are in grey hadn't been um, grouped at this stage, but you can see now when you can start to group these, you discover a new moon, if it's there or there, you can start to see where it might actually fit in with the other moons. This one here I think is probably that um, S2017 at the start that hasn't um, been given a name yet. So what actually happens is that we can look at each of these groups and name the group after the largest moon in the group. So the largest moon in this one is called Pasiphae. I don't know if my pronunciation is right for all of these, um, but you can correct me if uh, anyone knows some of these uh, languages. The Ananke group here, the Kame group. Now these ones here, Thymisto, Carpo and Valetudo, are obviously just on their own. There's maybe other pieces to find in the future, and the Himalaya group here. Now we've done this with the inclination, we can do the same with the um, orbital um, eccentricity, how squashed the orbit is, and you can see that you get a pattern ar uh, arising as well. So same kind of pattern, so you can be pretty sure when you take this and this together, and it, this is simplified a bit, there's a bit more you can do, you can actually even look at the colours. And you can see that these probably all came from the same original object, so this one here probably came from a larger moon, which you'd call Himalaya. This one here from a larger moon, we'd call Ananke. And you can see actually there is a kind of a separate grouping in here, in this group, the Pasiphae group. Possible it actually did, is made up of um, pieces from more than one object. And this is where the colour comes into it. One of the moons in this group is quite a bit redder in colour than the others, so there's a mixture of grey and red objects. So it's quite likely that maybe um, some of these, um, the red, redder objects in that group came from one object, called, it's actually called Sinope, and the others came from uh, another moon called Pasiphae. So now that we've managed to simply just take the uh, information about the orbits, so how squashed they are, or how round, how round they are, and the semi-major axis and the angles, and work out where they came or possibly came from, we can start saying that the Himalaya group probably all came from one object, an Anki, Pasiphae, and Kame, as I mentioned before. You can see the names here. You can notice that all these end in A, and all these end in E. There's kind of a naming convention that says um, that prograde uh, moons, the ones that go in the same direction as, as Jupiter, should end in A. Uh, the retrograde moon should end in E, um, and they've added O to the moons that are um, uh, prograde as well. So when you're na uh, naming a moon, it has to kind of fit into the um, naming convention there. And in fact, I don't know if those colours are too hard to see, but the um, latest five to be named are Ursa, Pandia, this one here, and these get a bit hard to um, pronounce. But these were just named in the last um, few years. Um, actually, a competition was, um, was held, and they got uh, people to um, send in their ideas for the names, and these are the names that were chosen. Um, previous to that, they were given names like S2003, J, and a number. And so there's still a few more to name. The general idea of the names are that the moons are named after the lovers or descendants of Jupiter or Zeus. Uh, that's the general idea. The large moons, Io, Europa, Ganymede and Callisto, were actually originally named 1, 2, 3 and 4 by Galileo. And another, another um, astronomer who found or discovered them only about a day after, I think, and I can't quite remember his name now, but he named them um, the names we see now. 
And later on, as more moons uh, got discovered, it was kind of thought that the numbers were getting a bit silly, so they um, started using those uh, more interesting names at that point. So here we are with this complicated uh, group of moons. So what, were, what was probably 79 moons to start with, or oh, what is 79 moons now, was probably only 10 to 12 moons originally. So these may be the original objects, just named after the largest um, moon in the group. Of course, the four big moons are, the large moons are always in one piece. The four within the orbit of these are the Amalthea group, so probably um, named Amalthea. So this one up here, Sinope, is, these are the two that are currently grouped in the same group, and Sinope was quite a red-coloured moon, and that's why it's possible it comes from a, a separate object. They could have broken up as they were being captured by Jupiter due to tidal forces and collisions, um, or they could have uh, broken up while they were in orbit around Jupiter, or a bit of a mix, so it's hard to know exactly when, the, when they separate into their pieces. So you might wonder how you actually capture an asteroid or an object. <clears throat> when an asteroid comes, or a Kuiper Belt object, or even a comet comes close to Jupiter, it'll be um, deflected by Jupiter's gravity. It will have a lot of energy, and it may keep orbiting in a few times, and then it will escape. It actually needs something to reduce its energy so that it can actually stay with Jupiter. Um, and with any planet that captures an asteroid, a bit like uh, Earth had a uh, second moon for a while back, there, and it was just a temporary capture of a small asteroid. But to actually um, become permanent capture, something else has to happen. One option, oh, actually here's a, a few pictures from a, a paper from 2011 which just shows some um, calculated orbits of temporary captures. You can see it's quite interesting little patterns up here. This one here is probably almost the easiest to understand as it goes around and eventually just shoots off. The fact that Jupiter is moving around the sun, the asteroid might um, be caught by Jupiter and the sun's tugging on it as well, kind of keeps it orbiting Jupiter for a little while until it finally escapes. Now, one way of um, keeping an asteroid is through something called gas, gas drag capture. In this case, an asteroid uh, will come round and in the early days of Jupiter, when it was, when it was still forming, the gas um, hadn't completely collapsed onto Jupiter and may have been spread out quite a bit. So an asteroid would come round and instead of following the line which I showed you before, as it came through the gas, it would uh, encounter friction and be slowed down and would be pulled a bit more towards Jupiter as it lost some energy. And then possibly would end up in an orbit, an elliptical orbit. Now, of course, that's a bit simplified because at the moment, when it comes back, it's still going to hit the gas and then something else might happen and a few more things will happen until the gas eventually settles down. Now, that's one way to catch an asteroid, one simple way. A second option is to capture a binary asteroid and split it up. So if we have our binary asteroid, two asteroids orbiting each other, but like a wheel on a bike, so they're kind of orbiting as they come past, and at one point, depending on the angle or on the position they're at, the uh, asteroid closest to Jupiter um, will actually feel a bit more of a tug from Jupiter. And at the same time, because that's moving that way and this asteroid is moving this way, the speed of this one with respect to Jupiter is actually a bit slower. And the speed of this one with respect to Jupiter is a bit faster. So Jupiter can latch on to this one and keep that one, and the energy this loses can be um, transferred over to this one, which will shoot off into space, and our asteroid will stay with Jupiter. Um, there would be cases, of course, you know, a, lot, a lot of these would not be caught by Jupiter, depending on the angle of the, um, of the orbit um, of the binary asteroid, if it was orbiting the other way, for example. But that's the second way of capturing an asteroid. And another way, of course, is interaction capture, where uh, an asteroid or object will come in, will either collide with a moon that's already there, um, or may actually gravitationally interact. So maybe the extra energy from this will cause it to move around this one. This one will get a bit more energy, maybe expelled, or it may just end up with a higher 
greater orbit, and this one will end up in orbit as well. So those are three ways we can actually capture um, asteroids than the way that some of those um, irregular moons may have been captured by Jupiter. Simplified, of course. So that brings us now um, to the Galilean moons, the ones that we see through our telescopes, uh, through our small telescopes. These three inner moons are really interesting in that they have found themselves in what's called a 4 to 1 orbital resonance. That means that every four times Io goes around Jupiter, Europa goes around twice, and Ganymede goes around once. <coughs> and that means um, because uh, Io takes about 1.8 days, actually 42 and a half hours, Europa takes twice that, Ganymede takes four times that, means every seven days or so they end up in the same configuration. And it also happens that they line up every week as well. So we have um, Io on one side of Jupiter, Europa and Ganymede on the other side. It gives them all a bit of a tug. And then 3.6 days later, another lining up occurs as well. And because that's happening so often and so regularly, uh, what would have been a circular orbit is just very slightly, um, just becomes very slightly eccentric, and so it's not quite a circle. And this actually gives these moons quite a bit of um, internal energy. Um, it's called tidal heating, and it keeps them very warm inside and gives them a lot of interesting properties. Um, Callisto, the further one out here, is not in any kind of um, resonance with the others and it's actually a much colder moon. We'll have a look at that one in a sec. So you might wonder why um, a moon that is moving further away and closer to Jupiter would actually stretch and squeeze like this. What actually happens is that when it's at its closest point to Jupiter, it will be uh, squashed, elongated this way, and of course this is very exaggerated, but the surface of Io will actually uh, rise up about 100 metres. So every 42 and a half hours, it'd be like standing on, rocky, on a rocky ground, moving up 100 metres and moving back down 100 metres. And that's stretching and squeezing it enough that it's uh, molten inside, even though it's way out in such a cold part of the solar system. Now that means that if I click on the next one, that if you're actually looking from the top, just on I, you just see it go, squeezing in and out um, every 42 and a half hours. Now, how does that actually happen? <clears throat> when, if, if this is Jupiter and this is our moon, the gravity from Jupiter at this point, let's say it's 10 somethings, gravity decreases with distance, so the front of the moon will have 10 somethings of uh, gravity, and the back of the moon will actually experience less gravity. This means that the difference between the gravity at the front of the moon and the back of the moon in this example would be 10 minus 6 equals 4. So in this simple example, this is like taking the moon and trying to pull it with a force of 4 somethings. If we move further away, of course gravity decreases, but so does the difference in gravity over the same distance. So even though the gravity is less here, we can find that it may be 3 somethings here and 2 somethings over here. The difference is only one, so the force, the tidal, this is called the tidal force, pulling the sides of the, the back and front of this moon is a lot less at this distance than at this close distance. And this is how when a moon is close to, uh, closer to Jupiter, that it will actually be stretched a lot more, and as it moves out, it um, becomes more circular, and so that constant stretching and squeezing heats the inside with friction. It's like bending a piece of metal um, until it becomes hot. And for those who want to know a bit about the mathematical side of this, the reason that the difference in gravity between the front and the back of a moon changes is that because gravity is, the strength of gravity is proportional to one over the distance squared. So the closer you are to the host, say Jupiter, the greater the gravity as you move further away the strength of gravity decreases in this curve. So as you get further away, the difference between this distance and this distance is a lot more than here. So the 
tidal pulling closer here is a lot, um, a lot more forceful. And you can see the further away you get, the less and less tidal, um, tidal effects you'll have. And the consequence of this, of course, is if you can see if this gets close enough, there's going to be quite a difference between the back and the front. And of course that leads to uh, catastrophe, catastrophe for the moon. If you get close enough to uh, the planet, uh, this distance is called the Roche limit. And once um, a moon or a body gets close enough to another object um, that it gets into this thing called the Roche limit, it'll actually pull it apart. It means the tidal forces from the back to the front of the moon are too strong for the gravity to hold the actual um, moon together. You'll end up with rings at this point. The Roche limit distance will actually um, depend on the composition and the size of the, the moon and also the object that's orbiting. So that's the natural consequence of um, getting too close to a, a large planet if you're orbiting it. So just having a look at the, Gal uh, the Galilean moons, the um, four that we've been looking at here, if we start um, with Callisto, Callisto is the fourth moon out from Jupiter, the fourth Galilean moon out from Jupiter. It's the third largest moon in the solar system, and it's also the most densely cratered object. Now, there's two reasons for it being the most densely cratered object. One is that it's so cold that the surface doesn't get refreshed by any um, ice or water coming up from below, so craters generally just tend to stay there. The surface is probably a few billion years old. And also it's not surprising when you see that Jupiter is going to be pulling in lots of meteorites and debris, and this one is the furthest out, it, it's almost protecting the other ones there, so it's getting the brunt of the, of the objects coming in. <clears throat> it does have a possible subsurface ocean, even though it's very cold and it's not experiencing the tidal squeezing and stretching that the other moons are experiencing. This ocean is possibly 10 to 50 kilometres deep under a um, layer of ice, maybe a couple of hundred kilometres deep. The ocean itself could be deeper if it's filled with ammonia, a kind of an antifreeze. So it probably actually has to have a bit of ammonia in it to keep it liquid anyway, as its distance from Jupiter um, doesn't allow it to be squeezed and warmed. But there could be radioactive decay occurring as well, which could actually um, keep the ocean liquid. Now the reason that um, it's almost certain there is an ocean there is that there is a bit of a magnetic field has been detected around Callisto. That um, magnetic field is caused by the magnetic field of Jupiter, which is kind of big loops if you think of the um, iron filings and the magnet with the north and south, you can kind of think of the loops. As uh, Callisto moves through the gravitation, uh, through the magnetic field of Jupiter, the magnetic field sets up electric currents in the salty ocean, and those electric currents in the salty ocean set up a magnetic field, and the field has been measured, which um, shows that there is almost certain to, to be an ocean um, in Callisto. Callisto probably never warmed enough to form a core, so all the um, ice and rock inside is just mixed generally and doesn't have a, a central central centre core like the other moons I'll show you in a moment. Now this one, Ganymede, is the largest moon in the solar system. It actually has its own magnetic field and this is because it actually has a, a molten core and this core, uh, just like Earth's core, creates its magnetic field, gives uh, Ganymede its own um, magnetic field. It has a subsurface ocean which may be 100 kilometres deep, and Ganymede will actually have more liquid water than any other object or body in our solar system. So Earth's oceans would be um, a quarter, maybe, of the amount of water that's actually on Ganymede. The ocean itself will be twice as salty as the Dead Sea, so a rather salty uh, place. and it sits between a surface layer of ice, maybe a couple of hundred kilometres deep, and the bottom of the ocean will actually also be ice as well. Unfortunately, because there's ice at the bottom of the ocean and the ocean is not in contact with the rocky mantle, it means any nutrients from that 
could find their way from the mantle into the ocean are blocked by the ice, which is not great for life if life had evolved there or possibly life couldn't evolve there because of the fact that it couldn't get nutrients from the ocean, from the um, mantle below. So there's actually another model of um, the interior of Ganymede. It may actually have two or three le uh, levels of oceans. This model says that um, the top ocean would be the least salty and the lower we go, the more dense and the more salty each ocean would become. So both these models kind of fit the um, observations. Uh, the observations being a, magnet a secondary magnetic field. Um, so in addition to its magnetic field that's uh, produced by its core, it has a secondary magnetic field much like Callisto did caused by moving through Jupiter's magnetic field, producing a current in the ocean, producing a, a second magnetic field. Due to um, Ganymede's actual um, intrinsic magnetic field, it will actually have aurora as well. If you were to stand on the surface, you'd see these, as, the human eye would see these as red. So it's much like Earth's aurora, caused by particles um, coming down its magnetic field to the poles. Unlike Earth, where the uh, aurora are caused by particles from the sun, of course, these are caused by um, ionized particles surrounding Jupiter, which are finding their way to Ganymede and producing these aurora. Now, if we move in one more, we come to Europa. Europa probably has about twice as much um, seawater as Earth. So Earth is actually looking like quite a dry place compared to some of these ones. There's a lot more liquid water out here. Europa is also quite a good candidate for life. Underneath a crust is a salty um, ocean. And unlike Ganymede, the ocean of Europa is actually in contact with the rocky um, mantle. This means that nutrients can flow into the ocean. There may be some undersea volcanoes and this would allow a lot of minerals to, to enter the ocean. It also is kept warm, of course, by the tidal heating, which warms the interior and keeps the, uh, liquid, the ocean liquid. Now, the fact that the ocean is actually in contact with the rocky mantle means that we can have these things called alkaline hydrothermal vents forming. What happens here is that seawater seeps into the rock on the sea floor seeps down into the hotter areas, reacts with the rock. The water comes back up, filled with minerals and um, other uh, molecules, maybe uh, a bit of methane and hydrogen. And as it comes up, it slowly builds up these structures called alkaline hydrothermal vents. The warm water comes out the top. It's usually only about 90 degrees, uh, so not boiling. It's, um, you may have seen some of those black smokers on TV, some of those really hot um, uh, vents under the ocean and on the earth, which can get up to 300 degrees. Um, this is a little bit different in that it's actually um, bearable for life, to, well, for life that's not quite as extreme as the 300 degree uh, um, options on earth, but life can actually form from these, and I'll show you how that happens in a minute. These are actual um, hydrothermal vents on Earth. Um, this is the Lost City Hydrothermal Vent Field in the Atlantic Ocean. And these are up to about 60 metres high. They're pretty huge. But the fact that we've got these um, on our oceans means we can study them. <coughs> and they turn out to be a good candidate for a precursor to cells. Now, this is a whole other talk, but just as a quick um, summary, there are little pores in these hydrothermal vents about the same size as a, a cell. These are alkaline hydrothermal vent pores. These have um, ideal um, properties for um, chemical reactions to occur. And what actually happens is the water that comes up from the, below the surface through the uh, vent is very alkaline. Uh, on Earth, at least in the, in the distant past, the ocean was quite acidic and with the alkaline water coming through and the acidic water on the outside, it set up what's called um, 
a proton gradient, which is getting a little bit technical, but it's similar to the way a cell works, and it's thought that that may be an alternative to the Darwin's little pond idea of life forming. So if that is um, how life formed, then um, Europa has a good um, chance of having life formed in the past and we'll still be getting nutrients there. It's one of the reasons that Europa is um, thought of as one of the best um, places to start looking for life and why there's actually going to be some missions sent there. Um, in 2024, the Europa Clipper mission is going to launch and it's going to arrive at Europa in about 2029 and it's going to search for signs of life and habit habitability. And the plumes that we see here have been photographed, which is a more evidence of the um, under ice ocean. These are plumes which can um, reach up to about 200 kilometres in height. They're fairly irregular, so this is um, two years apart, these two. This image over here is just artist, um, artist's impression of how this might work. We have our undersea um, vents and cracks in the ice. Which, uh, through which the water may rise in these geysers. Uh, these colours, I'm not sure if I mentioned before, but some of the yellow has actually been determined to be just normal table salt, that's um, sodium chloride, and some of these darker colours are other minerals um, and other salts that have probably come through the ocean as well. So there's a lot of proof of ocean, as well as these, a lot of these cracks, which may be from uh, freezing and thawing of the ice from warm um, sections underneath the ice and the water. This one here is Io, and Io I think is quite a fascinating one. We had a bit of a look at this one before. <coughs> this is actually the highest definition and most true colour image of Io. It's the most volcanic body in the solar system and possibly has its own ocean, but its ocean would be magma, so a global magma ocean. And this is the moon that gets uh, squeezed and squashed the most out of all of the um, three moons. That's why it is the most uh, volcanic. It actually, these are all volcanoes, these little black dots here. There's about 400 volcanoes on it at the moment. About 50 to 100 are probably erupting at any time. This is the um, an, uh, um, idea of what the magma ocean may be like, so covering the whole um, of Io, feeding the volcanoes. Uh, there's another model too which says that the um, volcanoes may be caused by pockets of magma, and there's a couple of other uh, models as well. One of the ideas that, this, uh, that support this idea is that some of the volcanoes seem to have slightly different um, chemicals um, gas is coming out, there's a lot of sulphur dioxide and a lot of sulphur monoxide, but some of them seem to have more of, I think it was potassium chloride, um, and a feature of these little pockets have different compositions that could support that idea. We really do need, a, need to send a probe there to have a, a look and to um, find out a bit more about it. Uh, so the surface is rock, and this is the rock, as I said, which moves up although you wouldn't really see it, 100 metres, it's still a long way, and enough for the, the heating of the Io. This is a volcano, a volcano actually being um, caught in action. It's, they can actually um, reach about 300 kilometres or more in height, um, possibly even 400 kilometres, and that's actually the height of the International Space Station over Earth, so if you imagine a volcano erupting and the um, plume going up to as high as the um, International Space Station and then cooling and raining back down. The blue colour is probably due to sulphur dioxide as it cools and turns into snow, so sulphur dioxide snow, snowing from about 300 kilometres up and coming down to land and that gives it the, the blue colour while it's up there. So, yeah, so sulphur dioxide snow coming from a very high height. Now this is um, a volcano erupting taken by the um, New Horizons um, probe on its way to Pluto. It's actually just five frames over and over again, but you can see the kind of umbrella shape as the plume goes up and then comes speeds back down again. I'm not sure if that's another volcano there, but uh, 
That's definitely one there. It's, it's pretty incredible to actually catch that in action. <coughs> Io actually loses a, a ton of material to space every second. Um, it, it weigh, it, the mass of Io is billions and billions of tons, so it's not going to affect it, but it's a lot to lose to space every second. This is an infrared image of Io when Io was in the shadow of Jupiter. This one is um, actually taken by the Juno spacecraft, and each of these is uh, obviously a volcano or a hotspot under Io. So it's a rather neat picture taken in infrared. I think that one may be a, a volcano that was erupting at the time, but I think it's quite a startling picture to see that. <coughs> now, a lot more is actually happening with Io. This is called the Io Plasma Taurus. This is a, a big cloud of um, plasma, which is ionised particles coming from Io. What actually happens here is that uh, particles are ripped off or torn off Io and travel around Jupiter. They're pushed around by Jupiter's magnetic field. The magnetic field of Jupiter is slightly off-centre to Jupiter's rotation by about six degrees. And so as Jupiter rotates and its magnetic field rotates, this whole system takes 10 hours to move around Jupiter. And the particles in this are travelling about... 265,000 kilometres per hour. Io is travelling about 65,000 kilometres per hour. So these are passing Io at about 200,000 kilometres per hour. So if you could imagine um, 200,000 kilometres an hour, it's about from Earth to the Moon in under two hours. So if you could imagine being on Earth and a whole lot of charged particles rushing past Earth at at that speed, fast enough to get to the moon in two hours, ripping the atmosphere off, you can imagine what it might be like on Io. This just is a depiction, these blue, um, this blue area, a depiction of the particles being pulled off Io. So what actually happens is that the electrons in this um, torus um, actually ionise the particles in, in Io's atmosphere and they add to the, the torus. This is an image of the Taurus, which was taken um, on the Earth. The Taurus you can see quite clearly here. It's actually blocked here, otherwise the um, other radiation would uh, make it too hard to see. So you can see the shape of it here. This was taken on Earth, um, probably infrared, I think, but the Taurus actually radiates in <clears throat> wavelengths all the way from extreme ultraviolet right through visible, right through to infrared but the visible portion is um, way too low energy for us to be able to see, so we can't actually see it. But you know it's there now. But that's not all. What actually um, happens with these um, electrically charged particles rushing past Io, it actually sets up a voltage across Io of 400,000 volts from one side of Io to the other. That sets up an electric current of 5 million amps through Io, which continues through space to Jupiter, so five million amps of electric current flowing through space in the Io flux tube. And in this um, Io flux tube, um, particles are caught up and they are sent to Jupiter, to the poles, and we can actually see, so we can't see that, but we can see the results. This is the aurora on Jupiter in ultraviolet, and it's just overlaid on a normal picture of Jupiter that we'd see, so this is uh, visible light, this is ultraviolet light. This little dot here is where the Io flux tube touches Jupiter. So you can actually see the effects of this electric current in Jupiter's um, aurora. I'll just play that again because it's quite neat, as you can see out there. And the same kind of thing happens in the South Pole as well. So there's a close-up view. This is called the Io spot. But there's two other spots too. These are the Ganymede spot and the Europa spot. So they're actually doing a fairly similar thing, but not on quite as large a scale as what um, Io is doing. So that's something that um, a lot of people don't know about, and I actually found it quite fascinating when I first found out what was happening there. So much more than what you see through the telescope with those four dots. 
<laughs> so I did mention a couple of times about the Kuiper Belt and the Asteroid Belt, and maybe not everybody is familiar with the Kuiper Belt and the Asteroid Belt. We probably all know about the Asteroid Belt between Mars and Jupiter. It's not as dense as that, that's been way overdrawn. You could fly through it and probably never see an asteroid, but it's such a big area that you can have a lot in there and still not see anything. So these are the asteroids, and further out near Pluto's orbit is this thing called the Kuiper Belt. These are mainly icy bodies, which are like asteroids, but um, quite a few of them are quite a red colour. They're covered in organic material and um, frozen methane and ammonia and other bits and pieces. And it's thought that Jupiter may have some of its irregular moons caught from this area, and there may have been the occasional um, objects sent in towards Jupiter from the Kuiper Belt. There's also two other little groups of asteroids here, the Trojans. These are about 60 degrees away from Jupiter in what's called a Lagrange point. And these are stable areas in the orbit of Jupiter. So these, these little groups of asteroids can actually orbit around with Jupiter constantly. And it's possible that some of these Kuiper Belt objects have been sent in, ended up in here, and maybe caught by Jupiter. And the red, um, not the not Amalthea that we saw, but the outer uh, red small moon that I talked about before may have been a Kuiper Belt object, and that's um, why it's thought that maybe um, a Kuiper Belt object is one of the moons. And possibly a lot of binary asteroids were caught uh, the way I showed you earlier. And actually finding these moons, this is a dis called a discovery image of the moon Pasiphae. What you do is just have a whole lot of pictures and find something that's moving. It's not um, that easy to find these things. So this is a um, discovery of the moon Pasiphae. Here's another one with, I think it's Eurydome. It's a bit fast, but you can see it's just three, three images and oh, here's something moving. Um, carry on with a bit of analysis and eventually work out the orbit and work out that it's orbiting Jupiter. And here's one called a recovery image of Valetudo. Recovery images uh, are taken a little, quite a while after a discovery image, so um, just refining it again. So that's Valetudo. And if you get enough uh, points, like some of these previous ones, if you get enough points, you can work out the speed and the distance between the points and work out the orbit and eventually um, confirm that it's the moon of Jupiter. So, as I mentioned before, there's maybe another 600 at least out there, so um, someone's got a lot of work ahead of them. So, that's getting pretty close to the end. Um, so, I'll just quickly summarise what we saw, that Jupiter has 79 known moons. We now know that there's four inner regular moons. We've seen the four Galilean moons and the 71 irregular moons. We know that the irregular moons are small, probably shattered remains of larger objects with fairly large eccentric and inclined orbits. And the Galilean moons are the large moons, some with oceans, magnetic fields, aurora, one with active volcanoes. And now when you have a look at Jupiter and the four moons through your telescope or binoculars, you can actually start thinking about what you can't see there. And that brings us to the end of the talk. So. Questions? I've got a couple of questions, sorry. Mm -hmm. First of all, some of those um, outer uh, and more recently discovered um, moons like S2017 J6000, oh, I was listening. Very nice. Um, <laughs> what sort of calculated periods are we talking about? 35 mm. million kilometres out from. Jupiter, so that's yeah. my first question. That, that so, one, I'll answer that before I forget. Yeah. Uh, that one, uh, the 35 million kilometres, um, takes a little under two Earth years to orbit. So it takes quite a while. So that's probably the longest orbit, a little under two Earth years, right down to that close one of seven hours. So quite a difference in the periods to orbit. Mm -hmm. Jupiter. The question was the, the smaller inner moons inside mm. the Galileo mm. moons. Uh, do they act as shepherd moons for the ring system? Um, they do, as well as feeding the moon, uh, the ring system as well. So there's uh, about four different rings named, uh, two called the Gossamer rings, which are out near the um, Amalthea and Thebe, and then there's the main ring with Matisse and Adrastia, and one little ring a bit further into, which uh, is just a, 
Um, very hard one to see. Mm. Hi. Uh, the camera is hard to watch. Well, they are, yes. So they actually had the same face facing um, Jupiter all the time. So all, all four of them, yeah. And so, for example, on Io, the stretching and squeezing, you'd be standing in the same place um, going up and down all the time. So, yeah, so those four are tightly locked, yeah. Um, you said that the regular moons are all, uh, sort of tend to have larger orbits, mm -hmm. and they're all going, in most of them seem to be going in a different direction mm -hmm. to the prograde ones. So, so is, is there a reason for that? What, so what, why is it that it's actually, some, of the, yeah. some of the further out ones have ended up sort of rotating in the... In the Mm. It's actually easier to catch um, a moon in a larger orbit if it's retrograde. Uh, there's this thing called the hill radius and it's a certain distance away from Jupiter where the sun's influence will have more influence over the, um, over the moon than Jupiter itself. So once you get out to the, the hill, what they call the hill radius, um, a moon can easily be pulled away but it turns out that a retrograde moon will actually um, survive more easily, and that's why those further out ones are actually so retrograde. The mm, yeah, so it's quite a bit comes into play, and that, that's uh, the main part of it is that, uh, yeah. Also, I guess with the direction that Jupiter is moving around the sun, um, catching up to an asteroid, you're probably going to have more chance of catching an asteroid going back the other way that's on the outer edge because... Um, the speed will be a little bit slower as well. So a few things come into play there as well. Mm. No other questions? Oh, here's one. Yes. Uh, just Sorry. <laughs> in the solar system, mm. everything rotating around the sun, mm. are they all retrograde or prograde? Um, so if we look down from the top, they'll all be going anti-clockwise. Um, and so they'll all be prograde because the sun will be... You'll be right, I think, we'll be uh, rotating the same direction because they all form from the same um, uh, nebula to start with, which would all have been spinning in the same direction. So generally... The asteroid belt as well. Uh, the asteroid belt, that'll all be going in the same direction as well, yeah. Yeah, no other questions? No, <laughs> That's good, I must have answered everything. <laughs> Cool. Well, just one comment I was going to make about the mm. question of people who are observing Jupiter. Because the uh, Galilean moons, they actually, the orbital plane is pretty much intersecting the plane of the solar system as well. Mm. That means that the shadows of those moons are often passing across mm -hmm. Jupiter's disk. Um, so you can observe those with your telescope at home. Quite interesting to see. You yeah. get sometimes one shadow trends at its cool so you, mm. you may not see the moon but you can see its shadow on mm. Jupiter mm. sometimes you can even get as many as three at once mm. I don't know if four is possible but maybe quite that's a good question <laughs> I know three is I just thought it in a comment to relevant, historically relevant to your talk mm. there's a plane at the moment at the ASB waterfront theatre called The Life of Galileo I'm not normally a theatre guy, but I got shut in one by the camera during the week. That's actually quite good, so something to keep in mind. And they had quite nice young ice cream at the back. Um, <laughs> but I see you coming more importantly, Jonathan, thank you so much. That was an amazing and oh, very informative you. talk. Um, and we're very grateful for you coming up and talking to us. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.